These were the last moments of Bradley Bowsen's life caught on a CCTV camera in Western Sydney. The 20-year-old is walking home from the shops when a car pulls up and four people jump out and approach him. They're plainclothes police officers. One of them grabs him. Bradley turns and runs along the street back to his own house. There's no vision of what happens next. Moments later, gunshots ring out. His father, Adam Balzan, is inside the house. I woke up to the, the first two, and then the, another two shots went off. I knew it was gunshots then. On the morning of Bradley's death, Adam Balzan saw a police officer at his window. He tried to walk into his backyard and saw there was another officer there too. He told me that um, in the, in a, the struggle, um, a couple of shots were let off. I, he actually said that the silly bardiga tried to grab at my gun. I did ask him if he knew who it was. He told me he didn't know. He was asked to leave his house. It was a crime scene, but he couldn't find Bradley. They wouldn't let me out to see who it was. Yeah, his, his phone wasn't ringing. I was sitting in the front yard and an officer went out and took a picture of him and brought it to me, showed me on his phone. The picture on the phone was his son. How could it happen? How could this happen? Very blessed to have all these photos of him. Bradley's grandmother, Nola Bowsen, has what she calls her gallery of love for her grandson. I love this one up here where his little cousin asked him to have a tea party and he spent the rest of the afternoon having a water tea party with her. He wasn't the best student. Not, a, not all kids are academic, so... And he did muck around in the class and everything like that, but, you know, nothing deserves to happen to him but what has happened to him. The group of officers who stopped Brad were part of a proactive crime team. They were based in the Pean in Sydney's west. An inquest into Bradley's death is looking at how these units operate and the broader culture of proactive policing, which is about stopping crimes before they happen. <coughs> Retired Detective Superintendent Mick Platecki was critical to introducing proactive policing in New South Wales. So the key element with proactive policing is that it is about interference of that criminal business plan. Mick believed he could lower the crime rate by increasing police interactions with the community. It shows the total crime for the uh, command, and as you can see, as proactivity increases, you can see this marked drop in crime. So how significant was the, the crime rate? How low it got? Um, it, in this particular case, it dropped 34%. So it was a, it was a good, good drop, and a, it was a, you know, a fairly substantial sort of... A, a, an event in terms of the local area. In 2002, Mick successfully pitched his model to the New South Wales government. I was able to implement it across a number of commands, so I could actually show that it worked off, off uh, th those commands. But after the state government introduced crime reduction targets in 2006, the New South Wales police changed the approach and imposed search targets on commands they needed to meet. And the trouble with that was they then put numbers on things like knife searches and uh, move-ons rather than actually letting the officer actually make that decision when they're in the field. He says the loss of that agency poses challenges for officers on the ground. I think there's a risk that you'll get an element that will do things that are outside the rules. But I tend to think that the vast majority of officers do the right thing, but uh, when they get a lot of pressure on them, they might say, oh, well, perhaps I should be doing X. In the year 2000, there were more than 18,000 searches against people in New South Wales. The year that Bradley Balzan was killed, there were more than 200,000 searches. That's more than a 1,000% increase. Since the removal of search targets in 2021, 
Searches have now started to drop in many areas. It sounds cliched, but the things we were looking for were the hurried footsteps, the, the furtive glances up and down the street, two people coming together, you know, putting their heads down and then turning a corner, walking up an alleyway. Liam McGibbon is now a defence lawyer, but he used to work in a proactive crime team in Sydney's King's Cross. He saw value in proactive policing when it was done right. But he grew disillusioned because of a strong focus on the numbers. Essentially, if you couldn't uh, demonstrate to the command that how you were performing um, in terms of your statistics, so look at this, I've gotten 20, 30 person searches, this block of shifts, um, look how proactive and how deserving I am of being in this unit. Um, if you couldn't demonstrate that, then you weren't being proactive, you weren't doing your job. You know, encouraging police to um, proactively patrol and therefore generate statistics that might look good on paper um, is not a particularly good way to police, I don't think. Um, to deprive someone even temporarily of their liberty by virtue of an ordinary or frisk search is, is a very serious thing. The New South Wales Police told 7.30 that proactive strategies have a direct correlation to crime reduction and there are multiple ways to measure officers' performance. The actions of the police officers that morning are being closely examined at the inquest into Bradley's death. The three officers who gave evidence at the inquest said that what drew them to Bradley was that he was wearing a hoodie on a warm day in an area that was high in crime. They said they didn't have grounds to stop and search him. But things escalated when one of the officers grabbed him. Brad wasn't known to him at all. All the other people they said they pursued on that day were people they knew. He just was a young bloke who wore a hoodie on that morning, unfortunately. The inquest heard Bradley had very few encounters with police. He had previously been charged with possessing cannabis and property damage. The police officers told the inquest they chased Brad here and then into the backyard. The inquest has been given different accounts from the police officers as to what happened next. So far, there's been conflicting evidence as to whether or not Brad actually had control of the gun, and if so, how he came to be in possession of it. The family hoped the inquest would reveal the police body camera footage of what happened in the backyard. But only one of the officers present had checked out a body camera from the station that day, and he'd left it in the car. I still don't know. I still don't know how. He could have got the gun in his hand, whether it was on the ground, whether it was taken off him. They said that um, it had trace DNA on it from Brad, but um, no fingerprints, no solid DNA. They said he was pulling the trigger, trying to shoot him. I got tattoos. Never thought in my million years that I'd have a tattoo. Nola was at the inquest every day. She has reminders of her grandson everywhere. So I got the sunflower for Brad, his name. The green heart is the justice for Brad sign and always with my heart as well. The inquest resumes next week. Do you feel like you're ever going to find out what really happened in that backyard? No, I'll never find out. How do you want Brad to be remembered? It's fun, loving. He was always... Always had everybody laughing.